Math for shooters, hiding stuff from your wife, and reloading manuals. This week on Mail Call Mondays. I'm John McQuay with 8541 Tactical, and this is Mail Call Mondays, the show that answers your questions about precision rifles, optics, and equipment. Welcome to another Mail Call Mondays. Let's get started off with our questions. First one right off the bat is from Papa Sierra. It says, my son asked if you could touch on ranging with the reticle and why math is important because I'm a dad and don't know. Teenagers. Well, really ranging with the reticle, first of all, we put a really long drawn out uh, how to range with a reticle. Uh, it's called the mill relation formula. We put an article on our website and without actually going into that in detail again in a video, I will just leave a link in the description below on where you can go and read up on that and show your lovely teenager all the different formulas that we have to go through to get good range estimation at long range. Uh, additionally, math is critically important because almost everything we do with ballistics requires formulas. Um, I'm a knuckle drag and trigger puller. Sometimes I can't count beyond 10 without taking my shoes off, but I understand the need for this math. Some of the formulas, when you really get into why things work and how they work, are really long and drawn out. Uh, I mean, very complex formulas when you start talking about actually uh, how the bullet reacts in its environment. So math is critically important. Uh, mainly algebra, a lot of the stuff that we do when we get into high angle shooting is trigonometry. So those skills are really important and it's really uh, necessary to get a good solid foundation on the fundamentals of math so that you have those skills and if you really care to delve deeply into them beyond just a ballistics calculator uh, then you can really get in and utilize those skills plus math just helps exercise your brain um, you know there was the the old sayings when i was going to school that hey you know you'll use this stuff for school and you'll probably never use it in real life well, if all you do is, you know, truddle through your life with your, your head down, then maybe not. But if you actually have a mind that questions why things happen, how things work the way they are, uh, math explains a whole lot of that stuff. So math is a very important skill. Glenn asks, are you still writing a book on long range shooting and when can we buy it? Glenn, yes, I am still writing it. Uh, writing a book is a very long, drawn-out process, especially since I have two full-time jobs, uh, 8541 being tactical being one of them, and, uh, of course, the street cop gig being the second one, and then I have some family time in there a little bit, too. So it's taken me a little bit of time to get this knocked out. Uh, additionally, uh, once we actually get the book finished, uh, hunting down a publisher to actually do it in print uh, may be a little bit more difficult and time consuming. Uh, doing the ebook thing is fairly simple, but a lot of you guys have expressed the desire to have a print copy as well. So once we get it done and get it edited and then start looking into the uh, publisher side of things, I will definitely keep you guys abreast on that. But right now it's just still in the writing stage. It's still just uh, raw type on paper so it's it's not even close to being published yet nick asks hiding purchases from your wife stealth acquisitions or hiding in plain sight well i would be risking my life nick if i told you it was a good idea to hide things from your wife um, really i honestly think and what i've seen in my marriage is honesty with your spouse is sometimes the best policy and most times it's the best policy it may hurt a little bit at first but you know when in the long run it will save you a lot of headaches uh, my wife is very very intelligent she recognizes change very well so trying to hide things from her would not be a good thing uh, she goes out shooting with me she enjoys shooting sports so she's gonna notice if I have a new rifle or a new scope or stuff like that so uh, hiding stuff from her is just not good to go and besides the fact you know if I purchase something new and something you know, that interests me. I like to be able to talk to her about it and show her things and 
you know, tell her, hey, you know, this is how it works. This is why this is better than something else. And so uh, not hiding it from her, keeping things out in the open makes it a, a whole lot easier process. And a lot of it depends upon your relationship with your wife. Um, me and my wife try to be very open with each other about things. So, you know, it's the money that comes into the household, regardless if it comes out of my paycheck or it comes out of her paycheck, is both of our money. Uh, we both have say in how it's spent. So, uh, really, honesty is the best answer. You know your wife better than I do, so you know it's it's going to be up to you how you handle that. But trying to hide stuff will just end up biting you in the long run. Pennybags asks, reloading manuals, are they all the same or are there are important differences between them? Is one manual superior to another? Thanks. Well, reloading manuals are generally the same. They all carry information on how to pair powders, bullets, primers, cases in order to make safe reloads. Uh, where you start running into differences is certain manufacturers will publish a reloading manual that covers mainly their products. Other manufacturers will cover other products. Uh, some manufacturers will cover a broad range of products. So if you're using one powder and one bullet combination, you need to make sure your reloading manual, of course, covers that bullet and powder combination. Uh, then there's other reloading manuals like the Lee reloading manual that if you can only have one, if you're first starting out, I suggest the Lee reloading manual. Uh, it has a great section in it on just the basics of reloading and things you need to do. So it's a great read even if you aren't set up to reload yet, if you're just thinking about it, buy a Lee reloading manual and read that whole first section on how to reload. It's a really, really great primer to tell you what you're in for. And uh, Lee reloading manuals cover a wide variety of bullets and powders. So it's not like if you're getting into a Sierra reloading manual that's just going to tell you Sierra reloading data or, you know, Hornady that tends to concentrate just on the Hornady products. So the, the Lee manual has a wide variety of stuff. And the longer you reload, the more manuals that you will collect. It just seems like every couple of years I'll buy another reloading manual because powders will change, manufacturers will bring out new stuff. Uh, the tried and true loads, you know, if you're loading 175 grain Sierra with Varget, uh, that's not going to change. It's going to be pretty much the same in everything. But you will collect them as time goes on. Eric asks, what do you think about frog lube? Well, as you can see, we got some frog lube sitting out here, and I've got the Mega Arms Ma 10 sitting here because that is what we've been using to test run the frog lube. Uh, when I started this rifle, right after we reloaded, or right after we built it, uh, I started using the frog lube on it just to generally see. I am almost to the point where we can do a video just on our review of the Frog Loop products. As you can see, we're in a shop here. This isn't a laboratory, so we don't have the ability to set up test rigs and actually do salt spray tests and friction tests and all this. But what I can tell you just basically running the stuff just like I would any other lube, it works well. It seems to stay on the rifle longer than some of the other products. A lot of oils when you're shooting a hot 308 semi-automatic, it burns that oil off pretty quickly and you just end up with a dry carboned up carrier. The frog lube paste stuff seems to stick around a whole lot longer. Uh, the smell has grown on me. I really like the, the minty smell that it's got. Uh, it's not unpleasant at all when you're cleaning or when you're actually shooting it. My wife, who is very, very sensitive to chemical smells, she really dislikes any strong chemical smell, didn't really have anything bad to say about it. Uh, my five-year-old actually really likes the way it smells, and I'm going to have to watch keeping that away from him, find him sitting in a corner eating it like school paste. Uh, but should that happen, this stuff is supposed to be all biodegradable, food-grade products, so uh, it shouldn't be a big deal. I don't know if I'm going to spread some on crackers or, you know, it's going to be the mint jelly on my next lamb dinner. But it's supposed to be non-toxic and that appeals to me because when we're cleaning guns, 
we get the stuff all over our hands. There's enough nasty things that come out of firing cartridges that I don't need to start adding more carcinogens and more nasty chemicals to it as well. So, so far I've been pretty happy with it. We still need to clean the bore of the rifle with the stuff and see how well it does actually clean the bore because it's advertised uh, to work not just as a lubricant but as a cleaner too. So we'll see how that works. Uh, as soon as we get done with all that, then I'm going to do a detailed video just on the frog lube. Matthew asks, steel versus aluminum for rings, mounts, and bases. What I've said for the longest time is it matters less about what the bases, rings, and mounts are made of. It matters more how well they're made. Uh, if you're comparing a really cheaply, poorly made pair of steel rings to a very high quality set of aluminum rings, then the aluminum rings are going to be better. If you're comparing high quality steel rings to cheap Chinese made aluminum rings, then the steel rings are going to be better. If you're comparing like versus like though, extremely high quality steel and extremely high quality aluminum, then it's pretty much a wash. And the reason I say so is that the scope that you're mounting to the rifle is more than likely going to have an aluminum body. Out of all the scopes that we have here, I only have one scope that has a stainless steel body, and that's a US Optics MST100. Uh, not a scope that you're going to run into very often in the uh, regular shooting world. Most of the scopes are aluminum, so mounting an aluminum tube and aluminum rings, you're going to be fine. The Any impact that is going to destroy those rings more than likely is going to totally destroy the glass that is inside of your scope. Now I have seen scope rings before that have sheared off where they attach to the base, aluminum rings, and I tend to believe that shearing those off and having the rings fail probably saved the optic because if it took that hard a hit that would shear off the aluminum and the aluminum didn't shear, if it held solid, then I tend to believe that the glass would have been destroyed in the scope. Um, however, as far as front to back impacts, the recoil lugs against the rail is going to hold very well. Uh, one of the arguments that I've always heard about steel bases on the rifle is that your receiver is steel, the base is steel, it's going to have a closer thermal expansion rate than a aluminum base on a steel receiver. That may be true, however, I'm not a materials engineer. I can't sit here and tell you what the expansion rates are of the different alloys of aluminum versus the different alloys of steel. Um, different alloys are going to have different expansion rates, and I don't know which one matches perfectly to the ordnance steel of your average Remington 700 receiver or the alloy that a AR receiver is made out of. I don't know that it really makes that much of a difference. I haven't seen a practical difference in the field on it. So my suggestion is stick with high quality products and worry less about if it's aluminum or steel. Most of my rigs have aluminum bases and aluminum rings on them because the aluminum is high enough strength to get the job done. It's high enough strength to go beyond what I expect out of the rifles. And it usually saves me a little bit of weight along the way. So that's my opinion on it. Um, if you guys got a different opinion, let us know down in the comments. I'd love to hear what you had to say on the matter. Hubert says, is it safe to use the same load from 175 grain Sierra Match King to 178 grain Amax? The load is 45.1 grains of IMR 4064 and the max load from Hodgson's website is 45.5 grains. Tango Yankee Semper Fidelis. Uh, Hubert, Semper Fi to you too. Um, if I had a lawyer sitting here in the room with me, he'd be coaching me to tell you to, whenever you're switching any component in your load, drop your charge by 10% and work back up. Uh, drop it by 10% and then at least load up a couple of cartridges over that span so that you can check for pressure signs when you do it. That is the safe way to do it. That is the best way to ensure that you're not going to blow your gun up or injure yourself. Now, I can't condone doing this, but I can tell you that I, in the past, on loads that I know are nowhere near a max load, I have switched between 175 grain Sierra Match King and 178 grain 
uh, Hornady, Boatail, Hollow Point with no issues at all. Again, that is not that is on the bottom edge. That is at like starting loads, uh, not even close to maximum loads, and I haven't had any problems with it. I always suggest going the safe route. Don't just do what I do because you know I'm taking a calculated risk. And if my gun blows up or I get injured, then I'm the only one that has to pay. Um, I don't want you doing anything that would injure you because I said so. So to be safe, go 10% below and work back up and you'll be good to go. Joshua asks, do you think it's worth the cost of having the barrel of my 700 SPS 308 threaded for a break or would a clamp on such as the Rodale work well enough? Joshua, I haven't had a chance to try the Rodale clamp-on brake. I've seen a couple of these clamp-on brakes out there, and I just, they probably work fine for light-duty applications. My concern would be when using a clamp-on brake, you're just using friction to hold that brake on the rifle, and the brake has some length on it. One of the primary reasons that I run brakes on match rifles is to protect the crown of my rifle from a fall. If I'm walking into a firing position going up a slippery slope or something and I take a crash and drive that muzzle into a rock, I want to know that the muzzle is protected, but I also want to have the confidence that that muzzle device hasn't moved at all. And with something like the threads on a 308, that's a pretty stout setup. It's going to take a heck of a hit to damage that and bend it and knock it off center line. I don't know that you're going to have the same safety with the clamp on brake. If you really drive that thing into the ground, you could get you know a couple of tenths movement on it. And if you do, you may end up having a strike on one of the baffles in the brake when you're shooting. And not only is that going to really destroy your accuracy, but it could be a safety issue as well. It can send pieces of bullet piece of jacket flying out the side of the brake, it could possibly injure somebody next to you or injure you or blow the brake completely off the rifle. So I really, until I get out with a scrap barrel, throw a brake on it and really beat the tar out of it, I can't tell you if specific clamp on brakes are going to be good to go. As far as your question on if it's worth it, I think it is. I really think it's worth it to have a qualified rifle smith thread your barrel, thread it concentric to the bore of the rifle. Don't just have them thread it on the outside diameter of the barrel. You want it concentric to the bore, that way if later on you decide to put a suppressor on it, then everything lines up. Or if you decide to put a really efficient tight bore muzzle brake on it, then you're not worried about there just being a little bit of leeway from one way or the other. So have it threaded by someone that knows what they're doing, have it threaded concentric to the bore, not to the outside of the rifle, and get a high-end brake. Uh, the brakes that JP sells, their uh, tactical uh, compensators are great brakes. Uh, the Surefire brakes like we have on the Ma 10 here are very efficient, they work very well, and they also allow you to add a suppressor later on. So there are a bunch of threaded on brakes that are really good to go. Uh, the clamp-on brakes, just they're, I've seen some that appear to be really good quality, seen some that don't. I haven't got a chance to bang on any of them. So be careful if you decide to go with the clamp-on brake. Joshua asks, buying ammo online, small or big orders? Well, go big or go home. Uh, if you have the cash to do it, then put in large orders because large orders will save you on the bulk shipping. It will s generally save you by getting a better price on the ammo that you're buying. So I would suggest buying as much as you can at one time. Uh, as long as you are not getting gouged on the price, if you're getting a good price on ammo, don't expect ammo prices to go down anytime soon. Uh, the materials that we're using to make ammo are not getting cheaper. Uh, manufacturers are seeing what the market will support, how expensive ammo can go, and how much people will still pay. It doesn't make good business sense for them to drop their price below that. So don't anticipate ammo getting cheaper anytime soon. Stock up while you can. Uh, buy what you need in the bulk quantities that you need. Now, I don't recommend just... Uh, buying everything that you run across because that screws your fellow shooter but if you're gonna buy buy in bulk 
Adam asks, what do you have to say about the designated marksman type of scope, like the Millet DMS-1 or Leupold Patrol? Well, I have, I've used the DMS-1 on our, um, some of our M14 rifles at work, and I really can't recommend the DMS-1. We've been seeing a pretty high rate of failure on them. Now, they are warranty, they're getting fixed, but again, it's a high failure rate. So I can't recommend that scope. Um, the Leupold VXR Patrol 3 to 9 power that we've been working with uh, appears to be a very, very nice scope. We're getting close to being able to do the video review on that, so stay tuned. Um, as far as their lower power offerings, I believe it's a 1 to 4. I haven't got my hands on that yet. Maybe when we get done with the 3 to 9, we may try to get the 1 to 4. Uh, we have a Bushnell 1 to 4 power AR optic that we just got in, and we'll be doing a little blurb on that here real soon. So stay tuned for that review as well. Uh, low power 1 to 4 power scopes are great on a rifle that you may be fighting close in with, or you may have to engage a little bit longer range targets. It wouldn't really be the greatest idea to go out and try to shoot a thousand yards with them, and mainly because the reticles on these scopes tend to be a little bit thicker. You don't really have fine crosshairs, you generally have some kind of center aiming dot. And when you're talking about center aiming dot that's two, three, four MOA, um, it starts to make it difficult to pick out precise targets at longer ranges. But for in close, even hunting, you know, contact to 300 yards, uh, they're going to be a very good option. They generally afford you a wide field of view, and so you can really see what's going on. A lot of them work well when you shoot with both eyes open, so you have good situational awareness. You can see what's going on around you. So that class of optics is good to go if you're using a rifle and type brush or using something for close in, but still want a little bit of magnification for longer targets. Michael asks, Average weight of your rifles. Well, Michael, my rifles are all over the board on weights. I have some that are smaller, lighter weight just for going out and having some fun tromping through the woods with, and I have rifles that are heavier, up to 18 pounds. The heaviest, I think, right now is the AE Mark II when I put the 26-inch uh, Krieger 243 barrel on it. Um, that one rocks right around 18 pounds, I think. Uh, it is a chunky monkey, but it gets the job done. Uh, it's still light enough that I can shoot it offhand if I need to. I'm not going to want to stand and shoot that thing offhand all day long, but for a couple of strings of fire on a stage, it's fine. Um, but, you know, really around the 16 pound mark is where I start to consider rifles overly heavy. Uh, the Mega Arms Ma 10 here, haven't weighed it, but guessing I'm going to say it's probably around a 12 pound rifle right now. Uh, we'll throw it on the scales here when we get close to doing the wrap up on it, which is coming soon, and uh, tell you what the weight is on it. But, you know, rifles need to be as heavy as they need to be to get the job done. I try to save weight where I can save weight, but I'm not going to save weight and sacrifice what I want that rifle to do. So don't so much worry about what my rifles weigh as what your rifle needs to weigh to get the job done. David asks, what distance do you recommend for a 308 to be zeroed at? Well, David, I've covered this a couple of times before, I think, but if it is a optic like the SWFA SS 5 to 20 here, where you have resettable target turrets that you can just reach up, grab, and dial quickly, I recommend zeroing the optic at 100 yards. At 100 yards, everything you dial is going to be up. If it's 50 yards, you're going to dial up. If it's 200 yards, you're going to dial up. You're always dialing up. So if you run an optic that has zero stops, then you can run it down, hit the stops, and know you're coming up from there. If you try to do something like a 200 or 300 yard zero on a zero stop scope, you're either not going to be able to use the zero stops, or you're not going to be able to dial for closer ranges. And that just really isn't a good option for me. So on almost all of my precision rifle optics where I have turrets to dial, I prefer to zero them at 100 yards. 
Now, if you have an optic that does not have exposed turrets like this, if they're capped turrets that you can't get to very quickly, if it's a hunting rifle, then there are a couple of other options to die or to set your zero on. You can set your zero at your closest range on the top edge of your crosshair, and that way it will give you a pseudo ballistic reticle to work with. And how exactly you do that is going to depend upon the specific load that you use. Um, another option is just to zero the rifle for what's called max point blank range and that you decide, decide what the vital zone of the target you're going to be shooting is and then you use a ballistic calculator to tell you what the maximum rise and drop is on that cartridge and zero for the range in between those. That way for max point blank range you know that from this range to that range all I have to do is put the crosshair in the middle of the target and the bullet will impact somewhere in the vital zone. That is a really good option for a hunting rig where you maybe have a duplex reticle, you don't have anything to be able to do accurate holds by, and you don't have the ability to dial for ranges. Ryan asks, on a recent range test video, I noticed that you shoot with both eyes open. Is there an advantage to shooting with both eyes open versus one closed? Does the fact that I'm right-handed but left eye dominant matter? Ryan, first of all, there is a couple of advantages to shooting with both eyes open. Uh, first of all, when you try to crunch down one eye and you keep that eye closed, you'll notice that your other eye wants to close as well. Uh, keeping one eye closed and the other open for an extended amount of time it can increase eye strain, it can cause eye fatigue a little bit more. So keeping both eyes open helps extend the time that you can go without getting eye fatigue. Uh, secondly, keeping both eyes open in a live fire situation uh, allows you to maintain situational awareness. Uh, if you are in a hunting environment, then it allows you to you know, see more game animals out in front of you, see a wider area. Maybe you're getting ready to take a shot and you notice, uh, hey, there's a better game animal out there. In a military or law enforcement environment, it's critical because you're not on closed off ranges. There's the possibility of something coming between you and your target. Um, I've had it happen before where I've been on barricades and had officers walk in front of my position before. Uh, having both eyes open allows you to know, hey, you know, something's getting ready to happen to come off the gun to save your weapon. Uh, that way you don't have a friendly fire situation. Um, in the military environment, it may be that, hey, you know, something's getting too close to me. I need to switch from that long range engagement mode to a close range protection mode and defend myself. So it, it really has a ton of advantages. Uh, one disadvantage that you're going to run into is that since you are cross eye dominant, since you're left eye dominant, right handed shooter, it's going to be very difficult for you to keep both eyes open because I'm right eye dominant and right handed shooter, when I switch over and shoot support side, often I have to close that right eye to keep the right eye from trying to dominate the sight picture. So you may run into the same situation being cross eye dominant. And that's why we generally teach people that if you are left eye dominant, you need to learn to shoot left handed. If you're right eye dominant, learn to shoot right handed. Uh, don't try to crisscross. You can make it work but it's not ideal. So the choice is up to you on if you want to shoot with one eye closed or if you want to try to learn to shoot left-handed and keep that left eye dominance. Bob asks, does Mirage really move the target? Well, Bob, Mirage doesn't move your target. Um, Mirage basically bends the air between you and the target. When it bends that air, then the location of the target changes. It's kind of like if you hold a lens in front of your eye. When you turn the lens, it will turn the position of the object downrange. So what you have to do when you're shooting a Mirage is watch that target dancing up and down. And the what I've always done, and I can't remember where I recall hearing this, but it was a high power shooter that was talking about watching the target dance and said, as you watch the target dance up and down in the Mirage, wherever the target is its lowest is generally where the actual target is downrange. So when you watch that Mirage bounce up and down, watch where the lowest image of that target is, and that's what you need to aim for.
That's what I've done. It seems to work for me, so give it a try if you're shooting in heavy mirage. Uh, some tips for heavy mirage, you may find it easier to pick out the target by backing your magnification off a little bit. I still tend to shoot at higher magnification in Mirage unless I really have a problem identifying the target. Again, I want to be able to see exactly where that target is bouncing up and down, and I like to hold on the bottom of the image of the target moving. So give it a try, see how well it works for you. But the target doesn't actually move down range, it's just the Mirage bending the air between you and the target. Larry asks, how do you figure out when it's time to rebarrel your rifle? Also, what are some signs your barrel is wearing out? Well, accuracy really should be your dependent factor on when you need to start looking at replacing the barrel. If all of a sudden your accuracy starts opening up and the rifle is no longer to your acceptable standards, then it's time to consider rebarreling it. If you're not sure, then it may be a good idea to really scrub that barrel out, make sure it's nice and clean, take it to a gunsmith that can throw a bore, or a bore scope down the barrel, and take a look at what the bore condition is. If you're seeing fire cracking, if the throat looks like alligator skin, if it's missing a large section of rifling beyond the throat, probably time to replace that barrel. One other thing that you can do is you can take a new barrel, when you get it in and you can check what the seating depth is on that barrel. Uh, you can check to see where the throat is on it and then watch, measure that periodically and as the throat moves forward you know you're burning out that section of the throat. Um, some guys use this and then they will seat the bullets longer in the case to compensate for it until you're beyond mag length or you're beyond really an acceptable length for that cartridge. Me, I run most of our guns at magazine length to begin with, so that doesn't help me out. I really don't care where the throat's at. If the barrel opens up, it's time to trash it. So accuracy really should be your gold standard and should be what decides on when your barrel's changed out or not. But when in doubt, clean it, take it to a gunsmith, have them bore scope it, and tell you if the bore's really tore up. Roger asks, what causes dimples in the case neck when using a sizing die? Most of the time, if you're getting dimples in the case neck, you are probably using too much lube. You got too much lube on it, and that is hydroforming that neck. If you got a little bubble of lube trapped in the die, when you run that case in there, then it will actually work just like a piece of the die itself, and it will form that case neck um, incorrectly. So if you're getting a lot of dimples in your case necks, try using a little bit less lube or switch to a different type of lube uh, when you're lubing those cases. Those are all the questions we have for this Mail Call Monday. Thanks for sticking with us, and thank you again for sending in your questions. Uh, make sure that you like us on Facebook, and watch our Facebook page because about Friday, Saturday, sometime around there, I will usually ask for more Mail Call Monday questions on our Facebook page. Uh, if you've got questions or comments, please leave them in the comments section below or send them to us on Facebook or Twitter. If you've liked this episode, please give us a thumbs up and don't forget to share and subscribe. Sharing our videos far and wide helps our audience grow and it helps us out greatly. And until next time, get out and shoot!